Welcome to Press On Podcast with Mike Woodruff, where Mike and invited guests share insights to cultivate a biblical perspective and thoughtful resilience in challenging times. Well, welcome to the Press On Podcast. I am very um, excited today. I have a chance again to talk to Gordon McDonald, who many of you will know. He was a uh, longtime pastor, 50 years, uh, Grace Chapel. He's been an author, a leader, a mentor. Uh, he has served in a variety of leadership roles at all kinds of organizations, either as a board member or as the president or as some sort of advisor at large thinking of World Vision and InterVarsity and Christianity Today. Most recently, he had a 12-year stint at Denver Seminary. He was an interim president. He was the chancellor. He has uh, been involved mentoring folks. Uh, I first uh, intersected with uh, Gordon's work, I guess, 30, 35 years ago, maybe, uh, reading Ordering Your Private World, which was very influential to me, and uh, he has uh, positively, for the most part, disrupted my life at various points. Uh, (laughs) We were were chatting for just a second here before we hit record, and uh, Gordon, you probably don't realize this, but uh, one of the times that you were speaking at Christ Church, I had you meet with the elders, and you made some passing comment. You said, when I turned I believe you said 60. You might have said 62. You just recently said 82. So that that's a little disconcerting. But you said, I made a promise that I will have be involved in no more institutional leadership at that point. And uh, I was probably in my mid-50s at the time. And I thought, sat up and thought, oh, wow, I can do that. I can say I don't want any more. I don't want any more board meetings. I don't want any more staff meetings. I don't want any more performance reviews or budget processes and strategic planning drills. Uh, I am still in that, plan to be in it for a while, but it was um, interesting to hear you say that then. And and, uh, as we were chatting, he just said that at 82, he gave himself, he and Gail gave themselves permission to get out of institutional leadership. So, um, So, Gordon. Welcome again. Thank you for uh, spending some time with me. Thanks, Mike. I'm I'm listening to this very generous uh, introduction of myself, and I'm exhausted, so I think I'll hang up. <laughs> well, that would not actually work out very well for me. As <laughs> as, as I said to you, uh, the last podcast I did was with this um, uh, Jordan Gorfinkel, a Jewish cartoonist, and uh, now it's you, and I, I sort of um, I love this podcast gig because it's, um, I, I read a book and I go, oh, wow, I'd really like to talk with that person, or I have questions, and this gives me an opportunity to do that. So whether it's a, a Jewish cartoonist or you, uh, I, I'm, I'm asking different questions. I, um, uh, you have been reflective. Um, I, I'm not certain that you would say that that was your initial um Part of your DNA, but at some point you figured out the need to be a little bit more introspective and reflective and ordered in terms of your inner world that led to ordering your private world, the, the book. Uh, I have very much had the same kinds of uh, challenges and have had to develop, uh, I suspect, similar kinds of habits and disciplines over the years but I can fall out of that alignment. And it seems as though uh, the last half dozen years have been um, challenging in some unique ways. There have been personally for me, for for uh, Sherry and me and our, our family have been, some of the hard times have been good times. Some of the hard times have just been hard times. And um, so I just have a bunch of questions and, uh, you and and listeners will quickly figure out they're they're not always uh, coherent, but I'm going to jump in if that if if that's good with you. Jump in, Mike. It's good to hear your voice going like this. <laughs> well, so one of the questions that I have been asking people is, and and when I say people, I mean people who have been following Christ for decades, is what have you learned? new about Jesus? 
in what ways has has Jesus surprised you? And what what insight have you picked up on that you are like, wow, this is a, a new chapter, a new wrinkle, a whole new uh, arena of of air, things that I just was not alert to in the past, but now it seems as though the Lord is bringing these things uh, out in my life. Well, we, you and I, uh, and I'm assuming I'm correct on this, you and I grew up in a similar culture uh, called evangelicalism, and to a considerable extent, particularly in my earlier years, that meant you treated Jesus kind of like a rock star, and uh, he was he was out there doing these fancy things and you you were following. What has hit me in the last few years, and it came out of a book project I did, is I never saw Jesus as he really truly came in whatever role back many centuries ago. And that is that he came as the, a, a rabbi. And I don't recall at any point in any of my training, anybody talking to me about the implications of what it means to say that a person is a rabbi. Jesus was a rabbi. That was the way he presented himself, and that was the way people in those days knew him. And so uh, I set out in the last two or three, four years to really understand what's a rabbi like. And uh, I discovered there are rabbis of all kinds back in biblical times in the first century. There were, there were militant rabbis, and there were academic rabbis, and there were institutional rabbis. Jesus comes along in his rabbinical presentation was, I think, word captivated in the word love. And what I began to realize is when you're a rabbi, your, your major, major emphasis may not be on preaching. It's really more in getting your movement going and training a select group of people who will take this strategy of yours long after you've left the earth. And so you have Jesus picking up and selecting, carefully selecting at least 12 men and uh, spending three years as an investment in them. And while he preached from time to time, his real priority was being with these guys as much as possible. And uh, all the way to the point where he's about to send into heaven, you're never quite sure these guys are going to make it. They seem very messy and seem very irresponsible. But then suddenly everything comes together in those last days. And the guys that you see in the book of Acts after Jesus has ascended are really true champions in every sense of the word and remarkable change. So when you ask the question, uh, what have I learned about Jesus? My whole view of Jesus changed when I got this rabbinical lens to look at him through and realize how he conducted himself and what could be expected from him. Hmm. By the way, I, 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 if I can just drop in, I have found that when I talk about this, very, most people are unimpressed. And, uh, and I, I say to myself, this is, a, this is really a wonderful secret. When you begin to put Jesus into the rabbi context, you begin to see a lot more of what the way, the way he was. Well, I generally find that when I talk about anything, people are unimpressed. So I'm not sure I would be able <laughs> to, uh, to discern that. but. Has the idea of Jesus as a rabbi changed your devotional practices in any way? Changed the way you read the Gospels? What 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 is the takeaway? So you're you're now in your 80s. You're reflecting on this. What do you do with the fact that Jesus was a rabbi? Well, I'm not sure I can draw a strong connection between the two categories, although there, it must be there someplace. But Jesus, the rabbi, you, you get the rhythm all the time of his engagement. He moves into the day-by-day -day marketplace activities. He's always pointing out to his disciples, see what you can learn here. Look at this. See that woman. See that man. Uh, using stories out of the marketplace, out of the fields. Uh, so that every day is a learning experience out of the realities of hour by hour life. But then, and this is, I think, the beautiful thing, is that Jesus knows exactly when to rhythmically withdraw from all of that busyness. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 35, I think it is, uh, illustrates this beautifully, where he has worked all day long as a, in the Sabbath day at the synagogue in Capernaum. 
And then it says very early the next morning, he got up and he went out into the fields to pray. No one knows, as far as I know, how long a period of time that was out in the field, but finally his disciples caught up with him. And they say to him, you know, master, they, they want you to come back to Capernaum and keep doing what yes, you did yesterday. And he says, no, I have other towns and villages to go to. So he's got this strategy, he's got this plan all worked out, and he spends time in the fellowship with the father that morning out on the hillside. And my sense is that what was really going on there was that the father had, and, and Jesus had this special relationship, and the father is giving him the day's courage and the day's sense of direction. He's drinking it all in. And when the fat, when Peter comes along with the other disciples, he's not, he's not uh, susceptible to their temptations. I'm not going back to Capernaum. I'm going back where the Father wants me to go. So there's this connection, and uh, and wherever he goes, he goes not necessarily as a preacher, but as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important uh, different differentiation. And it may be that his day's trip is more for the disciples than it is even for the crowds that he'll talk to. So you, you've had uh, a very um, public life. You've had a very um, a life of writing and leading and, and being, um, being on the move. And you have, as I said, reflected, you've shared about the need for that kind of Jesus retreating from the crowd to uh, spend time with the Father. What, what what have you learned? What would you share with me or just more generally with anybody about your devotional times and 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 how they have how they have changed? My I've I've been sharing with people that when COVID hit and we were, we were all in the lockdown, I I'm a little bit embarrassed to say those first um, in the first months, it was it felt like, oh my goodness, you know, the sky is falling. What's going to happen to the budget? What am I going to do? You know, just sort of looking at all these things. And I found the need for, well, you can appreciate this. Found the need for longer runs. I know you were a runner um, in college and beyond. And I found the need for longer devotional times, and and, and silence became much more important in journaling and just just longer times I did feel like I have to I have to be ready for the day zoom meetings at the time I just have to be in a better spot I have to bring energy into the room I have to be I have to be a voice of hope I have to be the non-anxious presence whatever that took a lot more work and I've held on to a, 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 I've held on to a lot of that just because it was became so uh, life-giving I, I didn't, I really, when everybody sort of emerged back out, I didn't want to come back out. It's like, no, I, I, I sort of like this. I guess I'm just asking, if, as you reflect on your own, the cadences of your devotional practices over time, yeah. are there things you, you share with people where you say, you ought to think about X, a little bit more Y, try Z, whatever? I, I got a bundle of answers for you on that one, at least as it's, it's uh, meant, I've used it in my life. My, I operate along the theory that about every seven to 10 years, the major question that drives your life changes. For example, in our high school or teenage years, the, the major question that I see is, who am I and who do I belong to? My, my parents or do I belong to my peer group? And then we move into the area generally of the 20s and the question becomes, what am I gonna do with my life and who will I do it with? In the, third, in the 30s, the question becomes, how do I get my life organized so that I can get the best uh, effects out of it? And in our 40s, we, has, we ask the question, how do I deal with all the change that suddenly is overwhelming me? My children are leaving home, my spouse wants to have a career uh, if she's a woman. Uh, my parents are beginning to make me their parent. So, and, and I'm not sure I like all the results of things that I gave myself to in the first 30 years. In the 50s, the question becomes, how shall I reorganize my life so that I can make sense out of the last 20 or 25 years? 
in the 60s, the question becomes, how long can I keep on doing the things that identify me? In the 70s, it's how do I live with all the loss that's suddenly coming upon me? Everybody's dying or going to Florida, one of the two. Hmm. And then in our 80s, the question becomes, what's heaven going to be like when my chance to go to it uh, presents itself? So there is the there are these larger questions that that, uh, that match those decades in, in a general sense, and you're being driven by those themes all the time. Back in December of 1968, um, I hit a wall. I uh, I went through a period of several weeks of great exhaustion, emotional emptiness, and spiritual emptiness. And on a Saturday morning, I found myself in a room in our house, just weeping uncontrollably and wondering if I was losing my mind. And for several hours, this went on. And my wife, Gail, was so generous and compassionate. She just held me in her arms while I had this catharsis. And then she said, uh, when the morning was ended, she said, why don't you just stay here for the rest of the afternoon and see if God has a message for you? which I did. And somewhere in the afternoon, I heard kind of a voice. I'm, I'm not a person who talks about voices very much, but if I ever heard a voice, I heard a voice that afternoon. And the simple sentence was this, now you know what it's like to live out of an empty soul. And that was so powerfully impacted me on me that, that the reaction I had to was what does an empty soul look like and how do I refill it? And I went down that afternoon to a stationery store late in the afternoon and bought a notebook and started writing down everything that God was leading me to think about. And the first thing that came to is, I have no silence in my life. I have no way of recording the gracious objectives of God when he wants to speak to me. I don't really have any plan for the building of the soul. And so on that particular evening, I made some commitments to a private life that has really stuck with me ever since. We're talking about something that happened 50 years ago. But that was the great measuring point or the marking point that caused me to recognize on a regular basis, I have got to stop and simply do what Jesus did on that hillside, find silence in the presence of the Father. So um, the words that came to me were, I need to learn what it means to dwell in silence. I need to know what it's like to keep a record of the things that God is leading me to think about. I need to develop a personal liturgy of some type where there's, there are repetitive prayers and uh, affirmations, which I can keep going back to on a regular basis. And I just need to make sure that I have two or three people in my life who are checking with me in, in, in spiritual life. So that was really the, the beginning of a, of a deeper, more uh, designed approach to Jesus and to building devotion into my life. Because up to that moment, I was just too busy doing nice things. Uh, but finally, on that particular day, I can pull out the journal uh, in my filing cabinet that I started pay, working with that day. But for both Gail and me, from that point forward, it was very, very important to have some kind of regularly scheduled withdrawal from all the busyness of life and into the quietness of a personal life. Thank you. I have, I have heard, uh, I've, I've read that account. I've heard you share that account. I know it, it, it grabs those, grabs many people and uh, your transparency on that is helpful. Um, thank you. Let me, let me reframe let me ref let me ask this, in, in one sense ask the same question from a different angle. Um, how are you making sense of the world at this moment? Um, it's obviously, I mean, from from Genesis three on, it's a broken world. There's um, there's and and from I don't know uh, maybe from Genesis four on somebody's been running around yelling that the sky is falling and that this is the end and and um, I uh, I have been um, I did not grow up in sort of an, an evangelical world um, I did sort of enter that in college and 
at some point, not too long into it, I felt like I had already heard that the world was ending um, six times and it hadn't. And I became a little bit hardened to the the next person that told me that it was going to end. And I, I think that that skepticism has been helpful. Um, so I know that uh, so I know that there's always people saying that the world is going to end and that this is crazy times. Seems like it's been a little bit crazier more recently. Yeah, and and it just feels that way as a pastor. I just had lunch with a half dozen pastors, and everybody's sort of like, "Oh my goodness, I'm exhausted." And uh, yeah, the tension, the the polarization in society, the number of issues that have become divisive, the challenges on the global scene. I mean, does it does it feel different to you than in the past? No, it repeat. It, it, for me, it's. I feel like it's a repeat of things that I've experienced before. Um, I have a vivid memory, Mike, uh, of life in World War II in the last year, year and a half. I was five, six years of age, but I was old enough to appreciate what was going on in that in that last year of, of international conflict. And, and after World War II ended, then the Cold War began to build up and the Russians became the new enemy. I can remember going to bed at night crying out of fear. Um, you know, people told me the Russians were going to come and they were going to crucify all Christian boys. And we heard conspiracy stories like that. I don't hear anything today I didn't hear back then. Uh, so I learned a little bit there not to get too scared off by all the conspiracy stories, um, just to recognize that God is the Lord of history, and I'm just not going to be knocked over by, you know, events that come along in the newspaper each day. So I think having grown up in those latter stages of World War II uh, made me look at what's going on today with a little bit more um, uh, not not the necessity of panicking about it. Uh, it it's it's going to go someplace, and out of it, God will make sense of it. And I'm I'm very much at peace with that. Yeah. Well, that's that's a good that's a good. Um, that's the answer I try to give. Uh, I don't always I don't always believe it. Sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, I'm I'm particularly concerned about that. And I guess I I. I found myself. I'm I'm reading a book now. It's unimportant. It's a it's a non Christian author, but he's writing about geopolitical strategies and this and that and the other thing. And it's it's interesting. And I know I I don't know a lot about this, but I'm finding him to be um, he he's bullish on America, but he thinks the next ten years are going to be particularly bad and onerous and whatever. So. I found myself setting the book down and reflecting because he doesn't speak at all about, he doesn't speak at all about culture. He doesn't speak at all about faith. He doesn't speak at all about uh, family. I mean, he's all geopolitical in his assessment. And I, I, I thought, wow, the things that I'm concerned about, agitated about uh, are not even in this book. So I found myself inclined to simply say, Lord, I don't know where this goes. I want to serve faithfully. I want to be faithful. I want to be, um, and I also want to be a person of hope because I, I, I just, I'm not going to live under the shadow of, you know, whatever the, the, the next sky's falling prophet. But I find myself sort of saying, I don't see any strategies forward. I'm praying for revival. Like that's the only card I got. Society drifts to the left. It resets with um, and maybe maybe this is a question. I think that I believe that society and cultures drift to the left. They reset with the war. They reset with a bankruptcy or they reset with uh, some sort of crisis or a revival. And of those, I'd pick a revival. Um, you, do you think like that? Do you want to direct me to a book? Talk me off the ledge. What, what's your take? Well, I was thinking as you were talking that uh, I guess I've never been much of a revivalist. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've heard so many predictions about a revival coming or there was a revival going and then it never delivered. 
Uh, if I were to go back in history and look at a revival, I would go back to John Wesley. I think there, yeah. there was a genuine revival in English history at, at that particular point. And it lasted for two to three generations and, uh, and could have gone on a lot longer if the uh, Methodist movement hadn't abandoned the class as its delivery of ministry. But uh, so I, I don't look for revivals. I, I look for a steadiness, a, 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 a group of Christian people who live steadily each day, making witness to the saving power of Christ. And, um, you know, I, I'm just not looking for something where you push a button and over a short period of time, everybody goes forward and gets saved. I don't expect it. Say more about the the Methodist sort of, uh, and I had my, I had uh, Michael Gleason on. He wrote a book called um, "When God Walked on Campus" and "When God Walked Among the Nations." And we were talking about the the Asbury prayer time and some of the stuff that was happening. So that was uh, I don't know a month or so ago, uh, and he would say that very similar things. He's he's I mean he's praying for revival. He's looking for it. He's uh, cautious that you know. What, what does he think about Asbury? He goes, oh, ask me in five years. Um, I'll, I'll have a better, I'll have a better assessment of, of what happened because real revival has a little bit different feel than some of what we were seeing more recently. But um, I, I guess I, I'd like to hear more about what you think the Methodists did wrong when they took a left turn instead of, you know, went straight ahead or whatever they did. Well, in the <laughs> left, I should qualify this and say I don't mean left in terms of political. Uh, I'll get, uh, I'll get. You'll get letters. That. Yeah. Have them. Okay. Anyway, you've got two men in the same generation, Whitefield and Wesley, Whitfield and Wesley, and Whitfield himself, when it's almost all over and Wesley's gone, Whitfield admits somewhere in his writings, he says, in effect. Wesley saw something I didn't see. He said, I was content to just call people to conversion and leave it there. Wesley recognized that was just the beginning. Mm -hmm. And when Wesley finally figured out the code, what he set up was a whole system of classes. And as long as those classes kept meeting around the four or five key questions which he designed for them, Methodism grew faster than any other Christian movement in the world. Now, I can't document this for you. It comes to me from a Methodist revivalist, not revivalist, but a Methodist scholar who says that in 1911, the World Methodist Congress abandoned the class as its key point of ministry. Hmm. Now, let me repeat that because I think there's something going on there. For all those years, the delivery of ministry in the Methodist system had been the class as the basic point of delivering the gospel and the way of life. Then in 1911, they kill that as the key, um, the key way of doing ministry. And my suspicion is, I can't, again, I can't uh, prove this. My suspicion is, is what they did was they gave in and said, the pulpit is the key delivery of ministry. Hmm. So now the pulpit becomes the delivery, the minute the preacher becomes the most important person in that sense, and the class has dropped. In the next couple of decades, Methodism went downhill numerically and continues going numerically downhill to this day. I think there's a message there somewhere. I think somebody needs to come out of the dark and recognize that in the small group of eight to 12 to 13 people, there is the power to deliver a discipling-oriented ministry that builds Christians more deeply and speaks into the culture in a most powerful way. I'm not smart enough to do that. All, all I do is I just have feelings about this, and I keep waiting to see if anything like that's going to come out in the coming years um, as, as a new way of doing ministry. The, well, yes. What, what, what is the method of the Methodists, uh, or what was the genius of the method of the Methodists? Well, when... Wesley's notion was you are not truly converted until you're in a class. So he wasn't overly impressed that a person might wave their hand in a, in a service, you know, when he said, let's uh, 
commit ourselves to Jesus. That was the beginning. But for him, a genuine conversion happened when a person entered into the fellowship of a class group and, and met every week. They, you know, it was almost like we used to do in Sunday school where you bring your envelope every week with your offering, your Bible verse, and whatever else. But every, every one of the people in the Methodist class had to come prepared to confess their uh, key sins, um, to, make, to give their offering. And there are two or three other requirements, but this was the backbone of, of the Methodist class in those days. And as long as that order was, was observed, those classes got really strong and perpetuated for the next many years. Yeah, well, I, I, I have been reading about Wesley and Whitfield and their the, the Great Awakening and, and, uh, and then Wesley's um, sort of the schedule that he puts his mm. itinerant preachers on, many of them uneducated, but the, uh, the amount of time they're expected to pray, to read the Bible, and to read all the other books that he had as part of his reading program. Yeah, so so we'll say a little bit then. Um, I mean, tonight I'm we're recording this on Thursday at three o'clock, and when I'm done, another meeting or two, and then Sherry and I are having our small group over for dinner tonight, and we'll, you know, share and encourage one another. We we there's there is occasionally confession of sin, but it's not usually in that group. It's a little bit more one on one. Um, so. So are you, you have been in groups, I've heard you talk about the kinds of groups that you and Gail have been in and the, the conversations that have happened and the, the, the deep lifelong friendships. Say something about how you have captured that. I got an email today from a friend saying, how in the world do I get men in small groups? I mean, that was his question. And I said, well, uh, Two things. Here's what I do, and and um, and good luck. Uh, keep at it. It's it's hard, but you keep elevating it up, and you have testimonies, and you talk about your own experiences. So, answer answer the question for my friend. Uh, how do you get? How do you create those groups or classes or whatever you want to friendship circles, whatever you want to call it. Well, I want to be very careful when I respond to your good question, and that is, I don't see myself as an expert or as having all the proven techniques in this thing at all. Gail and I decided years ago, and you probably have heard me talk about this, back in 1992, I was at West Point for a weekend and uh, got to, in, I, I was preaching for the weekend to the cadet uh, corps. And I was overwhelmed in my impressions of how disciplined the core was. And I began to see this genius of you select a few people out of the larger crowd and you teach them how to think and how to solve problems and work together and make plans. And on my way back home, I get in to realize, does my church do that? Do we have a place where we train officers in effect to be deployed? And the answer was no, we, we have leadership classes, but they're really very mediocre. So I went home and for two years, I talked about this to my staff, to the lead, lay leadership, and everybody smiled benignly to keep me happy, but nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. And finally, Gail said to me, it seems to me that what you're asking is something only the number one person in the organization can, can start doing. And if you want to select some people and train them, I'll be willing to come alongside of you and be your partner. I'm not going to be your secretary, not going to be your coffee drinker. I'm, I, I want 50% of the action. And uh, so we set out over the next two or three months to pray that the Lord would raise up for us 15 people that we could approach. And now I'll shorten this story because it's a long one. Um, we got 15 people to agree to come to our house every Monday night for 40 weeks, for three hours every Monday night. And uh, it became one of the most remarkable things we've ever done. I, I, when I look back over the years, I'd say it brought me more satisfaction than preaching. And every year we started with 14 or 15 more people, men and women, married, single. 
older, younger, and had them in our home. And, you know, we're talking now 15, 18 years later. Most of those people are still in leadership in one type or another in their church or in the community or whatever. But it was remarkable what happened when you held them to a high bar uh, uh, discipleship thing. And we taught them spiritual discipline. We taught them giftedness, Christian character, relationships, and then skill based on the what we thought were the spiritual gifts they had. But the, the answer to your friend's question is, first of all, it's going to take six or seven years to get people willing to see this as, a, as something viable. And the first thing that we all need to do is you need to get your elders permission. And it took me almost a whole year to convince our elders that this was worth my time. And uh, I, I wouldn't do a thing until they were willing to back me 100%. Then you had to get the staff backing because you were going to be leaving them alone. So we took two or three years to really get this thing moving. And, and then we did it for five or six years. And uh, it worked like a charm. I have a, I have a book that uh, Harper produced called Going Deep about it. Uh, but I, I learned then that it can be done, but it has to be done patiently and slowly. And the people doing it have to commit themselves to seven to 10 years to make it happen. Well, I read that book. Um... And yes, that is that is that is uh, that that is convicting. I, I guess I've got to think about that. Let, let me let me ask if you would reflect for a second on the lifelong friendships that you have had, or the intentional ways that you and Gail have been involved with. A handful of other couples. Uh, I've heard you talk about when you moved into your 80s that there was a lot of uh, there was this, this question of am I ready to die or am I ready for my spouse to die and how do I think about that and who's going to take care of me or in this case her if that happens. Is that a small group that you've been in? What, what's, what's the context for those discussions? Well, the context of those discussions is with Gail and me. As recently as earlier today, or was it last night, Gail and I had a long visit about dying. You know, it's, I don't want to make it sound like it's gloomy. or, But when you're 84 like we are, you have to talk about dying. You can't get away from it. If you do, you're stupid. So we we have a lot of conversations about what will happen. Sometimes it's done in a joking way. You know, it's the old story of, well, I'm going to go first. So you're going to have to know where the, the uh, insurance policies are and blah, 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 like that. And sometimes we laugh and sometimes we have maybe a tear or two. But uh, we we going back years ago, we began to realize we need to really build personal friendships. That, you know, we've we've kind of allowed the church to create our friendships. And then when it's time to leave the church, you leave your friendships behind. So who are these people that go with you, in effect, when you stop doing ministry? And we've had a handful of couples that we've met with over the years. We had, uh, Gail would tell me the correct number, but somewhere along 23, 24 years, we had a, a group that functioned on a regular basis. And that was the agenda. We want to be here to help each other die. What we didn't realize is that um, the dying would happen whether we liked it or not. So that group has slowly dissipated because one by one, the people in it have, have gone in one way or the other. Um, I would say right now, I have five or six personal friends um, that I would look to if issues became, you know, if, if I was losing Gail, these are the men I would turn to. Gail's, Gail's way ahead of me in, in, in her friendships. But if anything happened to me, she'd be well equipped in a, in a moment to have people come around her who would offer the strength and support or whatever it has. But in your 70s and 80s, you have got to get ready to die. And uh, a lot of people just keep putting that off. Uh, and you got to get ready to die spiritually and your thoughts about heaven. 
relationally? How do you prepare yourself to say goodbye to the people you love the most? Obviously, the business side of things. But starting around 70 years of age, most people better start having an agenda for getting ready for the end of life. Well, I think I think that is, um, I, I'm, I'm not 70, so I can't speak to it that way. I have watched my parents and watched others as a pastor, watched others, and have been honestly um, shocked on many occasions at how not ready some people were. And on a couple of occasions, and I've, I've, I've made a note and put it in my in the preaching schedule and talked about death, and I've said, okay, I'm going to talk about death. I wrote this down six months ago. This I'm not reflecting on any of the recent situations of the church, but I just want to let you know that I, I talk with people all the time who have not apparently uh, made peace with the fact that they're going to die. Should Christ not return, they're going to die. And that's, I think death, obviously death is an enemy. It's, it, it can be a tragic and ugly thing. Um, the act of dying, my dad, who had a wonderful fourth quarter of his life, came to faith and, and really grew. When he was told that he had six weeks to live, he said to the doctor, I'm not, I'm not scared of, of dying. I'm just sort of scared of the moment. <laughs> like, I, I'm not really, like, how is that going to happen? And the doctor was very pastoral and reassuring and, and uh, said, well, look, nobody fails at dying. Uh, you'll get through it. Um, and I can assure you that you're going to go peacefully because the kind of cancer you have, that's how this is going to end. It's not going to be, you know, gasping for air or whatever. But um, I'm just have been surprised. And I think I, I, I think I sort of saw that around the country and around the world when COVID hit and there was uh, just this not really an ability to have a conversation about the fact that a number of people could die that you know one death was not acceptable and I'm like wow um, I think I think we're all going to die well, and it seems like there's a big opportunity there pastorally and personally to process that. I was in Germany the first day that COVID officially started and uh, speaking at a conference and the conference was canceled within an hour of the time that the German government made its decision. And I was, I and a few others were quarantined for 14 days in Germany. And Gail and I began to wonder as that time went by whether we'd ever see each other again. Hmm. And on my way home, I, I I could spend a half hour telling you the adventures of going home that, that year because I was on the last plane that went out of um, mm. out of the, out of Europe that the president when the president canceled all flights. And when I walked in the home here and uh, put my arms around Gail, the first thing I said to her, the only thing I can tell you is that prayer got me here because mm. I really didn't expect that we would see each other again. Mm. And that was that really drove me very seriously to start thinking about, you know, what do I think about heaven? What's heaven going to be like? What will we be doing there? And I realized, and I don't know whether you can relate to this or not, that, that all those years I'd been preaching occasionally on heaven, but it was all basically kind of academic. And, uh, you know, I'm not interested in a heaven with streets of gold or mansions. Uh, that doesn't attract me now. Uh, I can think of things that do attract me, but uh, I think we who've had the privilege of preaching the Bible need to get much more serious during this period of time of preaching about what the hope of heaven is all about and something that's more realistic to 21st century people. Uh, thank you. I, I'm going to change the topic here. Um, we're 45 minutes in, so I just have uh, one more possible question. You may actually punt on this. And then I have my final five uh, sort of rapid fire. So lots of has been written in the last year, uh, lots of reports and books, uh, secular books, Christian books about the problems of men. How many men are failing, the, the lack of men stepping up, the number of men dropping out of the workforce, the number of men who are uh, 
not having the kind of resilience, perhaps you wrote a book about resilience. Do you do you look at that or have you read any of these books? Are you looking on with some thoughts about that? Yeah, I think I've been looking around, but not that it had to reach some kind of point where I feel like I'm an expert in thinking about it. I just watch men and I am having to be one myself, but um, I'm not overly worried about it, uh, frankly. I, I think we're going through a period of time where all of the culture of our, our globe is re resetting itself, to use your favorite word. Um, women women are coming up to take their rightful place. I, I watched the women championship basketball game a night or two ago. Those women are as good as any man. <laughs> and in the last 10 years, and there's been much controversy around their games now as there are around the men's <laughs> <Yeah>. games. <laughs> but you know, men are better fathers today, it seems to me. You see a lot of fathers wheel uh, with their, their ch children in the carriages going for morning walks when the weather's nice. They didn't do that when I was a young father. Uh, well, I don't think we were half the fathers that I see as some of the men around here. I, I love the way men today seem to really love their wives in some deeper sense. So I guess I'm not as disturbed about it as some guys good. are. I think. Good. That, that, that's a good. That's a good corrective. So I have uh, my final five questions, just looking for relatively short answers to these. Um, what, if anything, keeps you up at night? My grandchildren. Hmm. I've got five lovely grandchildren that I would die for in a moment. But I'm not too sure I know what kind of a world they're going to live in uh, as time goes by. And I'm not too sure they've gotten much of a good gospel in most churches. Uh, you know, by the time I was six years of age, I knew every Bible story book in the Old and the New Testament. Uh, I knew most of the great hymns. Our grandchildren don't know all of those, any of those. The, um, somehow the church decided a few years ago in many places to shortchange children on the things that build them up. And so I feel like our grandchildren are growing up with a, with a disadvantage that uh, uh, is painful to me. Gail and I pray for our grandchildren every night and we love them dearly and they, they love us. It's a great relationship, they're good people. Uh, in every sense of the word, they just don't have that deepening spirit of Christ's presence that we wish they had and that we used to see in other generations. Hmm. So my grandchildren keep me up at night. What are you reading? Well, I knew you were going to ask that. I thought, what am I reading? I, I've just finished in the last month a, a a book by Robin Dunbar on what's called the Dunbar number. Uh, he's a UK sociologist who um, has studied the grouping of people down through the millennia and has recognized that people group up in certain numbers depending upon their objective. For example, he would say you can only have five to six deeply personal intimate friendships beyond your family. He would say that you can only have 12 to 14 people if you want to have a training group. He would say that most large organizations can only go up to about 150 before they start losing their cohesiveness in communications and working together. It's a fascinating book, and every pastor ought to be convinced to, to buy this because it does a lot of explaining as to why churches grow or sometimes don't grow. So I've, I've been reading Dunbar and got a lot out of it. For more recreational sense, I've been reading Stephen Ambrose's book on comrades, which is an older book and I'm reading, this is probably the second time I've read it. But he writes about some of the great friendships over the last 300 years between men, like uh, two Indian chiefs and two army officers. And um, if you wanna talk about male friendship, this is, a, this is a fun book to read and somebody like you could read it in two hours. But Ambrose did a good job in building a, a, a simple book. Um, I've been reading Richard Foster's book on humility. And um, I've, uh, I've decided I'm going to become a humble person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, beyond, beyond the books, I, I'm a regular morning reader of the New York Times and every week the New Yorker magazine. Um, I, I, I am an avid reader of David Brooks as a columnist for Tom Friedman, for Peter Weiner and Peggy Noonan. They, they give me a good broad, broad spread of some of the philosophy of the, the, the thinking that's going on in our country today. Uh, so, uh, and then finally, a book by William Klingesman called First Century. It's a history book of all the things that went on during the hundred years around the formation of the church. It's not a Christian book. It's a history book. But it's, a, it's interesting to me that Christians spend their whole time studying what went on in, for three or four years in the beginning of the church, not realizing that the whole world is an operation in those days. A million and a half Chinese people are dying, for example, in a major flood in China about the time that Christ dies. Nobody knows that. Hmm. Uh, there, there's just Who's also, the author of this? You said uh, William? William Klingsman said K-L-I-N-G, uh, K-L-I-N-G-A-M-A-N, Klingman. It's okay. not a new book. Okay. Uh, you, you might have to do a little looking for it, but it's, it's been a very valuable book to me. Okay. Um, this may, you may have answered this, but is there somebody, you mentioned Brooks and Noonan, um, is there somebody that you are learning from? Uh, I, I anticipated that question, and my first answer was going to be not really. At my age, uh, it's <laughs> hard to, to, you know, to find people older than you. But yeah, I feel like I'm learning from people all around me all the time because I'm a person who dotes on questions. And uh, I, uh, you know, almost no one crosses my path without my thinking up a question to ask them. So I'm looking up to people all the time. I, I have a standing breakfast every Friday morning with a lawyer and a, a real estate executive. And, uh, and on Monday morning, I have a standing meeting with 14 pastors that I mentor. We Zoom together, we've been doing it for three years, and uh, I'm drawing from all of these people all the time. Uh, what, what, you know, what there is for me in need of intellectual input or spiritual input, they're, they're my go-to people. Okay. Um, what book or, or movie or magazine or podcast or something have you been recommending most often in the last year? Well, in terms of Christian literature, there's not much more there any more than CT. And uh, I write for a German magazine every month, but that's in German. <laughs> so you're you're you are fluent in German, so you are you are. No, I'm not German. fluent. I write it in English, and it goes off to Germany, and 72 hours later, they've got it all um, translated and ready to go. And uh, so it goes out in German, although I have no idea what I'm reading when I look at it. I've been writing for them for about 10 years. Well, maybe you could ask Chat GPT to read it for you and make sure that it's saying <laughs> yeah. the right thing. Um, okay, last question. Are you, other than writing for a German magazine and uh, occasionally for maybe some CT publications, are you working on another book? Are you, you have a big project ahead of you? No, I'm not working on another book. I, uh, I, I don't think there's anything I've got to say that somebody else isn't saying better. Um, I, my, I figured when I, when I reached 83, 84, I thought, why do I feel I have to be obliged to write another book when so many books are being written and so few of them are ever read? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I decided, I think that's a part of, unless God one day wakes me up with a thunderbolt, um, I don't think there'll be another book, but, yeah. Uh, but I, my biggest my biggest work and the thing I'm most delighted with are, are the pastors I meet with on Monday morning. Uh, that's been going on. We're going to celebrate our third anniversary next month. And uh, these guys just thrill me. And yeah. uh, if I were to die now, I would be very satisfied that God gave me a ministry right up to the end. Hmm. 
That's great. I'm guessing this came out of COVID. I ended up in two groups during COVID, one of which I dropped out of after a year, but another with two other guys. We It's Friday morning for us, but it has been a, a, a joy, a privilege, a uh, one of my favorite times of the week. Yeah, We spend an hour together on Friday mornings and then get together a couple times a year. Uh, do that and and yeah, I've come to really really appreciate love these guys and and uh, yeah. Well, um, thank you so much. Do say hello to your wife for me and uh, for all of the folks out here at uh, Christ Church who've appreciated uh, the time that you have given us over the years. Thank and, you. Um, I will look forward to uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm assuming that. Perhaps uh, we will have this conversation and you're going to tell me what the questions you should be asking when you're 90 are. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that, you know, at 84, you can figure that question out. I am trying to figure out, prompted by you a little bit, what the, how do I get ready for my 70s? I don't, that's a really strange thing to even say, but I am aware that I need to be living this decade thinking about the next one. And I'll just remind you, by the way, way back 30 years ago, uh, you spoke at an Ivy Jungle conference that I I coordinated for college pastors, the Ivy Jungle Network. You shared about your observations of Christmas letters that people were writing. They don't do it so much anymore, but how people in their 20s wrote a certain kind of Christmas card and people in their 30s and then their 40s. And you, you you developed all that. I thought it was brilliant. And I preached a sermon on it. And it will go down perhaps as the least appreciated sermon I've ever preached. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, I, it was sort of an evangelistic message that I gave around Christmas time, and I said, "What um, are you ready to write a difficult Christmas card?" Because you you mentioned that you know at some point people write a Christmas card saying you know I got cancer or my wife died or I lost my job, and I said, "Are you are you ready for that?" Well, that was not a well-received Merry Christmas. I came to church to be encouraged, and you <laughs> talked about that. So I blamed you uh, for what it's worth, but um, you've survived that. So I've survived it. Well, but thank the- you so much, Gordon. Appreciate you and appreciate the time that you gave me. And uh, we'll look forward to the next time our path cross. Thank you, Mike. May Jesus be with you. And with you. Amen. <laughs>